I shall tell you about a conversation I had with my daughter. So, um, what I ended up doing, we had a conversation, then I ended up travelling. And so I wrote her an email. And so I said, Dear Eve, hello darling daughter. I thought I'd take this time to write to you while I'm here on my own, with a comfortable chair and nobody's listening. <laughs> and I'm a scale. It's cool I get to see Pasadena. But I wanted to take a bit of time to enlarge on the discussion that the two of us had. Because uh, she asked me, she knows I work on the web, and she asked me what the deal was with websites. So she prefers to use apps. And I said, why? And she said, because websites seem to be quite slow and quite complicated and quite annoying. And I don't really get them. And I said, uh, but they could be a lot better. And she said, well, why aren't they better? Why is the web so slow and complicated? And I said, well, you really don't need all that JavaScript, I promise. Title of the talk. And she said, what does that mean? This is what it means. A lot of people talk about performance on the web. Why is it important? Anyone know who that is? That's Alex Russell from Google, runs Project Fugu. He's, he, um, he partially bid to the term PWA, Progressive Web App, um, along with Francis. He cares a lot about performance on the web, and if you don't care about performance, then you make him very, very sad. <laughs> and then he comes around to your house and sets fire to you with his mind. So, <laughs> but... If that's not a good enough reason to care about your web apps, your websites being snappy, being quick to deliver, there are other reasons. So you may have heard, those of you who build stuff for the web, you may have heard the term first meaningful paint. So, <coughs> excuse me. So Zach Leatherman tested a client-rendered React website. Any of you use React in here? A few of you putting your hands up, you might not like this talk. So, Zach Leatherman tested a client-rendered React site displaying a tweet against a plain HTML file rendering a tweet, right? Oh, no, sorry. He tested a React site rendering a single tweet against an HTML file containing every single one of his 27,000 tweets. So, 8.5 megabytes of HTML, which was faster. Can you guess? <laughs> it is a mystery. Let Zach speak for himself, right? Which has a, a better first meaningful paint time? The raw 8.5 megs of HTML or a client rendered React site with one tweet in it? And the answer is the huge block of HTML still renders faster, 200 milliseconds faster. Take another example, Remy Sharp. He built Terminal.Training, he does JSBin, a bunch of other stuff. He looked into doing syntax highlighting for code that he's posting to the web. So if he's posting code examples, you want it to be syntax highlighted because it's easier to read. So he looked into doing it both on the server and on the client. And what he ended up saying was this. Although the single HTML file is larger with server-side rendering, <coughs> total transfer size on the server-side rendered version is 10K smaller. And there's practically zero impact on passing time. Passing HTML is really, 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 really fast, which is really useful. And it's smaller because the server-side rendered version isn't sending the two JavaScript prism.js files. It sends prism and it sends the syntax highlighter itself. It's quite tempting to outsource a bunch of the work from your server, from your computer, because you have to pay for that and you have to wait for it and you have to care about its bandwidth. So you outsource that work to the world's largest distributed supercomputer, which is everyone else's laptop, right? The web. But the problem is the work doesn't go away. You're just making everyone else do it instead of you. And frankly, their computers are not as good as your server. Phones are mostly rubbish. Um, so Alex, again, since I put up mean pictures of him, I should actually quote him. The takeaway here is you literally can't afford desktop or iPhone performance, iPhone levels of JS, if you're trying to make good web experience for anyone but the world's richest users. Now, we're in a room here where most of us will have a pretty high-end phone, or possibly an Ubuntu phone or a Sailfish phone or something. 
but most people don't have that. Most people don't have either the latest iPhone or a pretty decent Android phone, a Pixel or something like that. Most phones are rubbish. They're really, really bad. So one thing to do is, one suggestion, serve less stuff. Then everything works faster. Unfortunately, you have a willing partner in this, which is the network, because the network hates you and it wants you to suffer. Let's talk about availability. So some of you may have seen this statistic. This is from GDS, the government uh, web service in the UK. And they said, when they did their surveys and calculated the number of people coming to look at sites, 1.1% of them weren't getting the JavaScript enhancements. Okay? And you think to yourself, well, 1%, not a big deal. And that 1%, you know, I feel sorry for them, but they're not really our target audience anyway. Someone who turns off JavaScript, right? They deserve what they get. And it's lots of effort to make our web app available to absolutely everybody. And it's just not worth it, right? I mean, it's a good idea, and we'd fix it, but we've got priorities, and we've got a backlog, and we've got business needs to meet. Maybe we'll do it next time. The point is, it's not like this, right? From GDS, the proportion of people that have explicitly disabled JavaScript or use a browser that doesn't support it is only a small slice of the people who d d that don't run the JavaScript. Most of the people who don't get the JS you serve, they should have done. There's no reason why they didn't. They don't have JavaScript turned off. They're not using some incredibly ancient WAP browser. Right? Um, so you may have seen this. So everyone has JavaScript. It gives you, it walks you through a list of reasons why your JavaScript may not have worked. Why well, someone goes to look at your site and the JS just wasn't there. You know, while the page is loading, it hasn't worked. Did the HTTP request drop? Um, did the HTTP request complete? Does your ISP block JavaScript? Um, there was a bit a few years ago where Comcast, I think it was, blocked jQuery. <laughs> the web basically stopped working. Um, anyone who thinks that the network doesn't interfere with downloads, I invite you to go to LAX and use their Wi-Fi. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of reasons why this kind of thing happens. And so the point is, it's like this. It's not 1% of people who always can't see your site and 99% of people who always can. It's 1% of visits. Almost all the people who don't get your site correctly should have been able to. They don't have JavaScript turned off. They're not on a WAP phone on a T 2G connection. They're you in a cellar bar or in a hotel room with terrible Wi-Fi or when Scale Public Slow decides it doesn't have an internet connection or they're waiting for the phone network to wake back up or they're on a train and it's just gone into a tunnel. And what's worse is it's not even like this. It's actually like this which is, imagine someone looks at the site, it doesn't work, and they go, fine, hit refresh. Or they're us, and you toggle the phone into airplane mode and back out again, and then hit refresh, and it works. But normal people, if a site doesn't work a couple of times, they'll, they'll go, they'll bail, and they won't come back. And so what actually ends up, ha ends up happening is that everyone's bailed, and no one comes back. Second reason, leave performance to one side for a moment. Second reason why you don't necessarily need all that JavaScript. And the answer is, it's unnecessarily difficult. Right? Um, a bunch of you put your hands up for having used React Web. How many of you are, or have been, or work with, or manage web developers of some kind? Good portion, I, I assume so, given the name of the talk, but it's always nice to check. The supposedly modern web, it's really bloody difficult to do anything with. I mean, look at all this stuff. Can you keep up with all of this? Every day you wake up and go, oh, another five things to learn. It's nuts. And it's not just me saying this, right? So this is uh, Drew McClellan, who does 24 Ways, part of Edge of My Seat. Uh, built Perch, or built up Perch with Rachel Andrew. And he says, increasingly there seems to be a sense of fatigue within our industry. Just when you think you've got a handle on whatever the latest tool or technology is, something new comes out to replace it. Owen Williams. People feel overwhelmed by the choices we have as modern developers. Always feeling like there's something we should be doing better. The web's incredible, but I'm not sure every app needs to be a React-based single-page application because the complexity is so great. Garrett Demon. 
We're talking about NPM and SAS and JavaScript dialects and build t technologies. At what cost? For every hour these new technologies have saved me, they've cost me another hour in troubleshooting or upgrading the tool due to a web of invisible dependencies. Those of you who are working on the web who have used Webpack, it's a great tool. It's fantastic. It does a bunch of brilliant stuff. But I've never heard anyone go, wow, Webpack just made everything so super easy and it never broke. <laughs> Is that Garrett? No, that's Garrett again. In the meantime, I could have broken out any text editor and an FTP program and built a full site with plain HTML and CSS in the time it took me to get it all running. And the site would have been easier to maintain in the long run. Rachel Andrew, who is um, uh, part of the CSS Working Group, she works for Smash Magazine, built Perch. I could still take a complete beginner and teach them to build a simple web page with HTML and CSS in a day. Don't need to talk about tools or frameworks, make pull requests, pull code in via NPM. We just need a text editor at a few hours. This is how we make things show up on a web page. And the point of this is not just overwhelm you with similar quotations. These are, these are smart, notable, motivated people who've been working on the web for years who understand this. They are, you know, the cream of our industry. And they feel overwhelmed by the tool set and the mindset and the amount of stuff we have to do. And I suspect at least some of you, if you're honest with yourself, some days feel the same. So in 2007, I stood on a stage in London and I said, increasingly people are making links, in quotes, on their web page on web pages which were JavaScript dependent and look like this. So you use, anyone remember Microsoft.xmlhttp? Am I the only old person in the room? Yeah, a few of you nodding wryly. Um, so people were building things which pretended to be a link but captured the click with JavaScript and then loaded something in with XMLHTTP requests and switched it over. And I said, if you want to make a link, don't do that. Do this, because it works. Check it out. <laughs> Right? And fortunately, I stood there 13 years ago and said that, and the world has listened. Because now people don't make links that look like, look like this anymore. Unfortunately, they don't look like this either. Now they look like this. <laughs> it's not clear to me this is a material improvement. But more importantly, why are we doing all this? Because I don't think people have done this just to annoy me. Well, most days I don't think people have done this just to annoy me. So take a step back. There are reasons why this tool chain, this tool set, the way we build websites now, there are reasons why we do this, and they are good reasons. This, is, this stuff is important. So we get things like component reuse, and there are big libraries of existing code that we can pick up, and you get a consistent starting point for new applications, Create React App or whatever. You get a good sense of organizational structure. You can embed best practices into the code that you're building. And that stuff's really important, but to me, I think these are after the fact rationalizations. This is, given we've decided as an industry to use all these things, what do we get out of it? And there's a kind of matrix thing going on here, right? You have to understand most of these people are not ready to be unplugged, like Morpheus says. Many of them are so inured, so hopelessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. And then you look at the web world and you say, are you listening to me, Neo? Or are you looking at the woman in the red dress? look again. <laughs> but I think the reason people started inventing client-side frameworks is this. The way it used to work is you clicked on a link, it starts loading that page, and then eventually that page loads in. But what happens is you click the link and then if the page loads slowly, you get a white screen. Now, browsers stop doing that. They make it so the page doesn't switch until the new page starts loading in. But then what happens is you click a link and it looks like nothing's happened. And essentially, this is a crappy user experience. Whichever way you do it, either you click on a link and the page goes white, or you click on a link and nothing at all happens. And what it basically means is it's a loss of control. We, as developers, we lose control over the user experience. And... If we lose control over the user experience, we don't like that. And frankly, we are right not to like it. User experience is critical to building things that people want to use. So we're control freaks. I'm a control freak! But 
people wanted to keep control over that user experience. So when you click on a link, you don't hand off to the browser and then have it graciously give you back control when the new page loads. So what ended up being internalized is the idea that page loads are terrible. Because page loads provide this bad experience where we lose control and then we get it back again, page loads are terrible and have to be avoided. So you say to yourself, well, what if, instead of the browser loading the new HTML page, what if I did it? That's easy, right? I'll just fetch or XML HTTP request the, the HTML off the server, and then when I get it back, I'll put it in the page myself. There's no white flash, right? So we avoid the loss of control by fetching stuff ourselves. And then someone says, ah, but sometimes, you know, I pull the new page off the server and then I'm inner HTMLing it into the DOM. But a lot, of the, a lot of the content is the same and that seems very wasteful. We'd rather say, when we get the code, only use the bits that we need to. And so you invent the virtual DOM. And then you say, ah, but when I pull a page off the server and then I put it into the page myself, now the URL doesn't change, right? Because we haven't actually navigated anywhere. And we want people to be able to send links around to our site or hit refresh and stay on the same page you're on. And so you invent client-side routing. And at that point, you are a framework. If you've got all of these things, you have built a JavaScript framework. And basically, it's all built on the fact that avoiding page loads is bad. Right? It's a pyramid. One thing built on another. But the problem is that it's a pyramid balanced on one tiny point. So, a uh, question. What if you could control the experience of new page loads, but without having to re-implement page loading yourself? This is what Portal is for. Portal, sorry. Basically, a portal is an iframe, but you can tell the browser, the thing that's in this iframe, make it be the main page. It's, a, it's an iframe you can navigate into. Okay? So this is a, um, an example from demonstration on web.dev. So in theory, I shall now show you a quick demo. Excellent. So, world's simplest web page. Doo -doo -doo -doo. So I can say create a portal, and then down here. So that's the, that's the scale web page loaded in a portal, basically the same as an iframe. But I can then say navigate into it, Bosch. And I've actually navigated into whatever was in the iframe has now become the main page. Okay? And this is all the code. Create a portal element, set its source, just like an iframe, and then it has one magic method, portal.activate, which says, make it be the main page. And that's it. But one of the nice things about this is, because we now have control over the experience, we don't have to, setting its source doesn't navigate into it. We can control that experience by going, okay, we can wait till it loads and then navigate into it. Because the portal is just an HTML element, we can control it with CSS. So we could, for example, animate the change. So if I switch back to here again, and then we go to the next one, I can now create a portal, same thing again. But now when I navigate into it, it should zoom up, which it did. Hooray. Second demo worked. Always encouraging. And the point about that is, I didn't do anything magic. That's not built into the browser. That's just CSS. I just used a zoom transformation on it. From, so from scale down in the corner up to the size of the screen. Bog standard CSS, same thing you do everywhere. But it's all controllable by the same techniques you do anywhere because now we've got a real HTML element. Okay, and then when we want to, when we want to navigate in, we kick off the transition by just adding a class. Scrolls in, nice and easy. And one of the nice things about this, in my opinion, this is not just for stupid demos, it solves actual problems. So an actual problem I came across, and we can see how this might help. So there is, um, I will say, a web framework, uh, because I don't want to call them out on stage. <laughs> um, but they had a problem with their documentation. The issue is you've got their docs are, you've got a table of contents on the left, and then 
the main frame, if you like, on the main bit on the right. And the other image, click an item in the table of contents, navigates the main bit to that piece of the documentation. And so if you were thinking about building this, how would you build it? Now, I mean, one way is just say, we'll just do them all as separate pages, right? Each page has the table of contents, I'm sorry, because the table of contents on the left, main stuff on the right. If you click on a link, it loads a whole new page, whole new table of contents, that bit of the documentation, no problem. The problem with doing that is that it forgets the scroll position. So if you scroll down in the table of contents and then click a link, and it loads all that into a whole new page, the table of contents is no longer scrolled all the way down. So you lose the position of where you were, the documentation, which is no good. I mean, the next thing that I thought of was frame set, and then I was told, no. <laughs> Don't do it with frame sets. Apart from frame sets being ancient from 1999, they don't change the URL when you navigate. So if you, if you actually use a frame set, put the table of contents in one frame, the main page in a different frame, and then click a link, it doesn't change the URL. So it breaks linking. You can't send a link to a particular bit of the documentation. Now, you could build it with an SPA, right? And maybe that's the way to solve it. But seriously, I mean, do we really need to use a whole single page framework single page app framework, just to fix this one tiny problem. Now, those of you who are web developers in the audience will be thinking, ah, ha, ha, I know how to solve this. What I'll do is, when you click on a link, we'll capture the link, and then we'll, we'll stash this, the current scroll position in local storage, or we'll put it on the end of the URL, or put it in a cookie, or something like that. I use a bunch of hacky JavaScript, and this is what they're currently doing. They're doing a bunch of work in that to when you, when you click on the link, they, I think they stash the scroll position in local storage, and then when the new page loads, they pull it back out of local storage again. And, I mean, that's just sad. We ought to be better than this. And so one way of doing this is with portal and post message. So the advantage with doing this with a single page app is that you never lose control. And that's what we want. And portals are the same, because unlike every other navigation there's ever been on the web, you have access both to the page you're currently in and the page you're going to at the same time. They're both available, so you've got the DOMs for each. And JavaScript in either of those pages can talk to the other one. But it's not like, it's like opening in a new window, except no one opens anything in a new window ever. But you had, when you did that, when you opened a page in a new window, you had the option of looking at window.opener to ask it questions or read things out of its DOM or call functions or whatever. Portal does the same thing, but inside a page. So what you do is you load the new page in a portal, and then you post message the scroll position to it. It then sets its scroll position and then says, I'm done, at which point you then activate the portal. So, another demo. And this should be the thing. So. You have, document, you have documentation and our left-hand contents pane. So if I click on second thing, it just navigates the second thing. But what that's actually done is it loaded a whole new page. So each of your pages is completely separate individual HTML. It's super easy to think about. There's no JavaScript framework involved at all. Because we did a real navigation, the URL correctly changed, the scroll position is still maintained. And if you don't have any JavaScript at all, what happens is it's still just a link. So clicking on that link will navigate to the new page. Fine, you lose the scroll position, but you don't break the ability to navigate around the site. So it's no code of the pages, no change to the pages, it just enhances how they work if your browser supports it. So, that's the code, not a lot. Which I'm not going to ask questions or anything, so don't worry about it. But literally all that does is create a portal, it uses the post message API, which already exists for iframes, to post, thing, to post the scroll position into the new page. The new page sets the scroll position of its left hand frame, and then we activate the portal. So, I should warn you about something here, which is that this stuff is hilariously unsupported. Um, it's sort of on a standards track, by which I mean 
the Chrome team just invented it out of a clear blue sky and then said, we should standardise this. So it only works in Chrome. Um, I believe it only works in Chrome if you've got a flag turned on. <laughs> um, there was a point when I was uh, talking about this and I was getting new versions of Chrome Canary every day until we got to the point when the portal stuff was supported. And it's still very new. So things like if you're using the dev tools to debug a page and you navigate into a portal, shuts down the dev tools. <laughs> so this is all still pretty new. But it feels to me like it's solving a real problem. There are certainly a bunch of things which need to be single page apps, right? Gmail should not probably fall back to being separate HTML pages. I am fine with this. But if you're building a restaurant website and all you want to find out is what time they open, it really annoys me when I get a spinner while it downloads 10 megabytes of JavaScript to show me that information. And I think a lot of the reason why people are using SPAs is because they value the user experience. And so not losing control over page loads, being able to do this really helps with that and that's why Portal is a good idea. Most of the time, you only really want to add some sprinkles of interactivity to an, inter to an existing page. The majority of websites aren't and don't need to be single page apps. And it's not me saying that, it's React saying that. React has been designed from the start for gradual adoption and you can use as, as little or as much React as you need. React components are great. You do not need to necessarily have your whole site be a component. I mean, and view, just so I don't only bag on React. I mean, it's a, this is a simple little page, but the point is that it's using view components, but in just a standard HTML page. So those little um, green and red indicators are view components, which are checking something in the background. View doesn't control the page, it just augments it. The other nice thing about this, and it's worth thinking about this, is that HTML is quite a lot smarter than it used to be. Just using HTML and CSS does a lot of stuff now that used to have to be built by hand as components because uh, the HTML standards track and the browser manufacturers do look at what people are building as components and say, should this be part of the web? Yeah, maybe it should. So, things like um, uh, text boxes which are also drop downs which is a completely standard component. The web didn't have it for years and years and years and years and years, and now it does. If I've got a mouse pointer, that's a text box, but it's also a drop-down list, and that's just using data list. Right? That's, uh, you've just got an input, and you put list equals whatever, and point a, a data list element, and then you get a text box, which is also a drop-down. Don't need to use a component for this, nothing. It's all built in. Field set disables is the same kind of thing. You, you can enable and disable a whole block of a form just with a completely standard HTML attribute. See, it says scroll snap. Have, how many of you have, possibly against your own better judgment, been told to build a carousel for something? Few of you. Um, what CSS scroll snap does is you can tell it um, if someone scrolls in this area, snap to a particular point. So. This is just, this here is just a list of pictures of pies, in fact. But if I scroll to there and let go, it snaps to the top of a picture. It can't be partially scrolled. So it's really useful for things like carousels, for moving from page to page to page, horizontally, vertically, whatever. And that's built into CSS now. Don't need a component for it. Don't need any JavaScript for it at all. And honestly, it's not that these things are super revolutionary, not at all. It's that... Each of these things would, at least a while back, have required a whole bunch of JavaScript enhancement to make work, and now they don't. But I am not saying don't use JavaScript. Right? I love JavaScript. It's really good. I've written books about it. It's fantastic. It's the programming language of the web. Don't avoid it. Just don't necessarily let it run anything. This is um, Anna Tudor. And she says, just because you don't understand a simple CSS solution doesn't mean it's weird or crazy. But it goes the other way as well. Adding a ton of extra elements just for the sake of having a pure CSS solution where you just update a thing from the JavaScript 
do it with JavaScript, right? It's good at this. Most of the time it will load. <laughs> Just be sure that you're not requiring all this stuff or nothing works. It's good to stay in touch with the latest tricks, the latest stuff that's going on. We're in a fast-moving industry. We really are. But stay in touch with all of the things that are relevant to your job. HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Or, frankly, don't. This is uh, Flacky from uh, Mozilla. It wasn't Mozilla. Says, Not knowing stuff is normal. Not knowing the new and shiny tech is okay. Feeling bad for all these things is common, and, but you're not alone, and you're fine. And this is what I think is a good idea. Fight the right fight. Don't fight against the web. There's so much in our industry and in the rest of the world that needs fighting against. There's so many ways we, as an industry, as programmers, as people on the web, as people at scale, so many ways we need to stand in solidarity with one another and with the world. And there's so many people who need our help. So if you want to fight, great, but don't fight the way the web is. Frameworks are a brilliant way to prototype stuff before the web gets it. Because it takes a shockingly long time to get stuff standardized. So if you wanted a carousel for years and years and years and years, you did it with JavaScript because CSS scroll snap didn't exist. Now, the reason stuff takes a long time to standardize is because the web standards track people put a lot of effort into making sure that it's accessible, that it works everywhere, that performance is good. And that process does take time. So... If you're ahead of the curve on something, if it hasn't landed in browsers yet, great. Go ahead and build it anyway. No problem at all. Use extra stuff if you need things that aren't in the web platform. But if, you're, if you find yourself always on the bleeding edge, if you find yourself every day saying, oh, we need this and it's, and it's not available yet, so we're going to have to use nine megabytes of JavaScript to make it happen. Is that really right? I mean, are you honestly on the bleeding edge the whole day to like make a login form? Seriously? So, finishing my email to my daughter. So I said to her, so, darling daughter, you asked, and probably a longer answer than you were bargaining for. But, you know, now you know. Hopefully that answers your question. Because it's valuable what we do as an industry. We've got the power to bring knowledge to everyone in the world. You know, we can connect people together when they, when they want to be connected together. We can be the greatest repository of knowledge and wonder and information that the world's ever known. And I want to keep it that way. That's what I think is important about the web. I love you. Daddy. Uh, Stuart. <laughs> Thank you very much. If anyone's got any questions, cool. Oh. <laughs> So the question is, if uh, data's taking a long time to load, then you show some static content first, and then when you've got the data, pop it at the page. This is um, rehydration, right? This is rehydration, basically. Um, it depends on your point of view. If you can serve the stuff from the server, so you're showing the static content, but it's the data the user actually wants, and then you go and fetch the same thing again, as JSON, and then build a bunch of components in memory and then virtual DOM them into place. Maybe just don't do the second half. Right, so... Yeah. 
Right, so the question there is more about if you're assembling a page out of various different bits and some of them are available instantaneously and some of them you've got to go and fetch for back-end service, so they take longer. How do you do this in this kind of environment? And I have no problem with using individual components for that. They make perfect sense. Like I say, I'm not saying don't use JavaScript. The point is that does your main page need to be a single page app to make that happen? No. I don't think so. Serve in your static HTML, serve that, and then have individual components load it in over time. Yeah, absolutely. Seems a perfectly reasonable thing to do to me. So it sounds like you're already to some extent doing this. But the key point is that if you're serving static content as the first thing you serve, it should be there instantly. You know, 100 milliseconds. Bosh, done. Because you're serving HTML from the server. So that's great. So you're already doing this. Nice. <laughs> Any chat there? Uh, I I do. Um, it, these things do just go to cryogenics.org. K R Y O G E N I X. Um, actually, assuming I've got this right, I'm not sure if I did this. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, do I need to not make it? Whatever. Um, <laughs> Gotta to type my own website address in blind. Yeah, there we go. That's my site. And down there is the link to the slides. So you can pick them up. It's a reveal.js presentation, so it's all built as web stuff because obviously I need to embed a bunch of things. Okay, anybody else? Let's chat at the front. So the question is, um, what about using service workers to populate pages with no content? And the answer is, you should absolutely do that. Yes. Um, uh, if, you've, if you've got a service worker running, then it can fetch content and cache it, so it's available when you're offline. Or, or more importantly, it's not just available when you're offline, it's available when the connection is slow or it's temporarily dropped out. Or, and because it's serving out of the browser's local cache, it's basically instantaneous. So taking the example from before, maybe what you want to do is load a page, populate it with the service worker immediately, and then fall back to the network. And there are half a dozen different service worker caching strategies. If you look at um, uh, service workers, the site is serviceworker.rs, or um, Google have got a bunch of stuff on this on our web.dev, and, and there's Workbox... I think it's called Workbox, um, which is um, a set of libraries around building a service worker, and you can think about the kind of caching strategy do you, you want. Do you want use local first and fall back to the network? Use network first, fall back to local? Do you want to just use local? Do you want to just use network for particularly critical, uncacheable resources? All that stuff's really settable up, which is handy. Um, Jake Archibald's done a bunch of decent thinking about this and helping you understand why you'd use one thing rather than another. Anybody else? Nope. Then I've been Stuart Language. That's where the thing is. Give me a shout if you need anything or want me to come and talk to your company. I will let you now go to lunch. Thank you very much.